Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Teresa Van, and I'm the Joseph S. Mikulov Curator of the Malta Study Center of the Hill Museum and Manuscript Library. One of the longer job titles here at St. John's. And I'm talking today about history, pseudo-history, and myth in regards to the origins of the order of the hospital. Now, I'm going to start with a definition of what is history. I, yes, it's an academic discipline. History uses primary sources. Uh, it, uh, it attempts to discover the past. It, history is also in that uneasy boundary between science and the humanities, because historians talk about evidence. You know, we use primary sources, original documents, in order to talk about evidence. But still, it's not hard evidence. Uh, interpretation comes into it. Uh, we have to, we have to always, historians always have to ask themselves, you know, is this document saying what I think it's saying? And also, historians have to deal with the investigator's bias. Everybody, everybody has a bias, whether they acknowledge it or not. And it's the bias of living in the society we live in, in the 21st century. And historians are always asking ourselves, are, am I seeing this as a 21st century person is seeing this, or am I trying to look at it in the context of somebody who's living in the 11th century. You know, what language are they using? What, what do these words mean to them? And it is an ongoing, an ever, never ending question of interpretation and reinterpretation. It's actually, there's just, History is never really finished or completed. Now, then there's this thing called pseudo-history. Now, I admit I am a fan of pseudoscience on television. If there are two plumbers from Rhode Island chasing ghosts in a haunted house, I'm on it. You know, they're running around in the dark with their Radio Shack EMF readers. And I also know that these programs drive hard scientists crazy because there's no scientific proof for ghosts. And these guys are not finding scientific proof for ghosts. Well, pseudo-history exists in a similar relationship to history as pseudoscience exists to science. It, it exists outside the realm of academic science, of academic history, I should say. Uh, Pseudo-historians don't interpret, well, if they use hard evidence, if they use original sources, they don't interpret the original sources as historians do. Instead, they manipulate the sources in order to fit into their preconceived view of history. Uh, they, it, they don't publish in peer-reviewed journals. Uh, historians are very unkind when they submit to peer-reviewed journals. Now, some of these things, some of these definitions could apply to academic history, because academic historians, if you've got a new theory, you know, the peer-reviewed journals might not agree with it. So you try another peer-reviewed journal. Uh, so, I thought I would include a response to the, to the uh, Rational Wiki's definition of pseudo-history. And you can read the entire response on the talk blog on their website. Uh, it goes on and on and on and on. I, ex I, I, excerpt I excerpted this part because I like the bit about uh, there are plenty of theories not accepted by academia 
because academia is a gender-driven and anti-American and far left that smears anyone who espouses that America was a nation founded on Christian ideals. And how dare academia make fun of the History Channel? You know, even though the ideal History Channel program would be, I think, Hitler meets ancient aliens. And I'm, sh and, I'm sh and I'm sure it's out there because I have seen the program where the ghost hunters meet the ghost of Hitler in Argentina. So I'm sure it's out there. So in a way, pseudo-history is like, well, it's like pornography because it's easier for me to describe it to you than to define it. And so if you run across any of these, chances are chances are pretty good it's pseudo-history, you know, and, and, you know, and you can talk with somebody who thinks that, um, JF, that uh, LBJ was involved in the JFK assassination, there's no way you can convince them otherwise. Uh, some of these are relatively harmless, you know, ancient aliens. Others are dangerous, like the Protocols of the Elder of Zion, which circulated in Europe in the 20th century and influenced anti-Semitism in Russia and Germany. And then finally, there's myth. Myth is more respectable than pseudo-history. It is, in some ways, it's an academic discipline. It you know, myths exist, you know, human beings tell myths, they tell mythic stories in order to make sense of the world. You know, we talk about creation myths. Uh, we talk about, you know, the, the story of why there's troubles in the world. Uh, you know, the great flood. There are these myths that are universal and they touch deep chords within human beings because, you know, on a human level they make sense. Now, in common usage, we tend to use myth as a, as a way to describe something that is completely made up. And I think that's because in our discourse, we're too polite to say to somebody, that's a lie. Because if you compare pseudo-history and myth, Myth is a positive term. Pseudo-history, it's a negative term. Even the pseudo-historians don't like to be called pseudo-historians. They see it as a derogatory term. And pseudo-history exists in defiance of history. It, when you read pseudo-history, you invariably, it's like pseudoscience, you invariably run across statements in which the writer will say, academic historians don't want to change their textbooks, so they won't listen to me. They sit there in their ivory towers and, you know, and just tell the, each other stories. Now, now, that we've run over this, you know, this Cliff Notes uh, definition of pseudo-history and myth and history. Now I'm going to talk to you about the origins of the order of the hospital. Now the order of the hospital is a, yes, I know. It is a, it is a religious order of the Catholic Church. It's a, it is a laic religious order. Uh, it is under the, um, it is, it reports to the Pope. It's under the, it is exempt from local jurisdictions. Uh, the modern order has uh, hundreds of priories around the world and exists to give um, humanitarian aid and medical care in, um, in disaster zones and war zones. They maintain a hospital in Jerusalem, uh, 
and they provide humanitarian aid. They also, as you can see, have a great many names. So if you run across these names, uh, this is the order of the hospital. Uh, there's also uh, Protestant uh, orders, which are called affiliated orders. Uh, these are the orders that used to be part of the Catholic order, but due to the Protestant Reformation in Germany and England, uh, they were suppressed or they and they are now revived as a, as a Protestant religious order and they're recognized as affiliated with the original order of the hospital. But I want to emphasize the order of the hospital does not have a football team. Now, 2013 is an important year for the order of the hospital. It's the 900th anniversary of the papal bull, Pie Postulatio Voluntatus. This is the bull that Pope Paschal II gave to Girard, who is described as the, as the director or the caretaker or the head of a xenodoxia, a hospital located near the church of, of Our Lady in Jerusalem. And so it's the Hospital of St. John, and it's Gerard, the head of this hospital. And it's a bull that confirms the hospital's rights to all the properties that they have acquired, and it ensures that they are exempt from any local interference. So the local bishop cannot interfere, uh, the local the local dignitaries cannot interfere. The members of this hospital are given the right to select their own leader when Gerard dies. This is in accord with the Gregorian reform movement. Uh, this, and it is similar to other grants that are given at this, at this time by other popes. In fact, uh, the incipit by which the bull is known, P.A. Postulatio Voluntatus, is the incipit of at least seven other bulls that Pascal granted. And it's, it's also used as an incipit for papal bulls throughout the, the 11th and 12th century. And what, it, and what it means is, you know, anybody who is wishing to do something good should be facilitated. And therefore, I, as the Pope, do grant these privileges. Now, for the order of the hospital, they are, grant, they are taking 2013 as the anniversary of, their, of the recognition of their existence as an order. OK, note that, the recognition of their existence as an order, because the order existed before 1013, or rather 1113. Now, for example, in the year 1110, Baldwin I, King of Jerusalem, confirms all the gifts made to the order of the hospital since 1099. Okay, this is in the past year. Okay, here's some background. The first crusaders captured Jerusalem in the year 1099. Uh, they selected Godfrey of Bouillon to be the first king of Jerusalem. But Godfrey said, no, no, I cannot be king of Jerusalem. There is only one king of Jerusalem. That is Jesus Christ. I shall be the protector of the Holy Sepulchre. He died after within a year, and his brother Baldwin became king of Jerusalem, and Baldwin had no scruples about becoming king of Jerusalem. He had no problems with that. And in this, this is the original here, which is in the National Library of Malta. And in it, Baldwin lists all of the gifts that Gerard and his hospital had received from the Christians in the past year. There's a lot of gifts here. 
And here is a copy that the Hospitallers made of the original bull in the, uh, in the 13th century. This is a legal copy called a Vedimus. And you notice it's much neater and cleaner and in much better shape. You know, because this document is so important because it confirms all the properties that they had been given in the past year. <clears throat> so obviously, uh, the hospital existed when the Crusaders came to Jerusalem. And the leader of this hospital was a man named Gerard. Now, here are some 19th century views of Jerusalem, the Citadel of Jerusalem. And back here is the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And here's the Church of the Holy Sepulchre, again, from another view. And according to tradition, the order of the hospital was right, or rather the hospital in Jerusalem was right by the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. You know, so that pilgrims could arrive when they were tired and worn out, they had a place to rest, and there were, and there were facilities for both men and women. And here's a map. Uh, the Hospital of St. John, right by the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And in 1972, the Venerable Order uh, placed this marker in the section of Jerusalem called the Muristan, which belonged to the Order of the Hospital. Now, there is nothing left of the hospital or of the medieval hospital in Jerusalem. So this marker is essentially what we have. And here is the founder of the order, an image of the blessed Gerard. Now we don't know much about him. Uh, according to tradition, uh, he was in the city when the Crusaders were besieging the city in 1099. And realizing that the Crusaders were hungry, uh, he threw loaves of bread to them. Uh, he was supposed to be up on the uh, wall throwing rocks at them. Instead, he's throwing bread at them. And uh, the Muslims saw that this man was throwing bread at the Crusaders and uh, hauled him before the authorities, and the bread miraculously turned into stones. Even so, they, uh, they uh, imprisoned him, and they beat him up, and they tortured him. And this is what he looks like today. Uh, this is... <laughs> Uh, this is the skull of the Blessed Gerard, which is in the Church of St. Ursula in Valletta. Uh, they received it from, as a gift from the master of the Order of the Hospital in Malta. And, you know, and who's to say that it's not the skull of the Blessed Gerard? I'm not going to go there. Uh, so here, uh, this is uh, engraving... Uh, depicting Girard in the 16th century. And I think this is a more realistic portrayal of what he would have looked like uh, after the siege, after being beaten. And um, yeah, I mean, that, that man could have lived through the siege. Now, what we know about his activities uh, starts a century later. The first account is written by the historian William of Tyre, and which he says that the hospital was founded sometime in the, in the uh, 11th century. He doesn't say exactly when. Uh, but uh, he said that merchants from Amalfi in Italy uh, purchased property from the emir of Jerusalem to establish a hospital, or rather to establish a monastery staffed by Latins, and that the monks 
then established a hospital. And uh, William said that it was dedicated to St. John the Almoner. Now the next account is uh, Guillermo of Sant Santo Stefano, who was the preceptor of Cyprus. And he's writing just at a time after the last uh, Latin kingdom, uh, the, uh, the kingdom of Acre on the mainland fell to the Muslims. Uh, the hospitallers had secured their uh, documents, their, some of their archives, not all. We don't know how much of their archives were lost. We suspect that there was quite a bit lost. Uh, we also suspect that they secured their relics, which is why it's plausible that Gerard is now in Malta. And it's at this time that he's recording the origins of his order. And he, follow, he agrees with William of Tyre, but he says, well, he got some things wrong. Uh, first of all, that it was Benedictine monks, and there were 50 of them, and they came from Italy. And they dedicated the, the monastery and the hospital to St. John the Baptist. Now, we do know that there was a... Um, that there was a, an Amalfite, that the, that the Amalfite merchants found in a monastery. Uh, we do know that this monastery established a hospital, and this, is the pro and this is probably the origins of the hospital, you know, that they appointed Gerard, one of the monks, to administer the hospital. And that Gerard must, I think he must have been a great administrator. Of course, that's too prosaic but he's able to get lots of donations within a year. He's able to establish this network with European donors, and he gets the Pope to recognize his hospital as a separate foundation. I mean, the guy should, the guy should get the Administrator of the Year Award. But that's, that's not interesting enough. Uh, William of San Stefano also recorded the miracula of the hospitallers. These were the stories that the hospitallers told about their origins. And they, uh, and they recorded them in a list, in listing of their statutes, in listing the, uh, their, the deceased masters of the order. And William said, or Guillermo said, no, these are not true. I'm going to record them anyway, but don't believe them. <laughs> oh, mistake. Oh, mistake. Oh, mistake, because what are the, what do the miraculous say? Oh, that it's, it's an ancient hospital. It's founded during the time of Judas Maccabeus. And that the father of John the Baptist, he, he's the administrator of the hospital, and Jesus Christ was, I don't know, an intern or a candy striper or something, because every miracle that Jesus made where he healed somebody, it happened in the hospital, and it, it, it was an incredible place. And these stories circulated uh, through medieval Europe. Uh, they were repeated in Rome, uh, and they're repeated elsewhere. And the order doesn't let go of these stories. Uh, in the 15th century, Guillaume Carosan, a man who I've spent a lot of time studying, and a man who should know better, because he is a real historian, uh, he, he, he just makes the myths better. He says that, you know, that Judas Maccabeus established the order of the hospital. And the highest praise that he can give to any master is that he's like Judas Maccabeus, you know. He, you know, he's the hammer of the infidels. And, yeah, that all these other incredible things happened and that uh, the first church council with Jesus Christ and all the apostles was there at the hospital. And, and, um, and with Karasan, these stories circulated in a 
in a wide learned public in 15th century Europe. They got printed and they became the basis of commentaries about the order of the hospital. So this is, these are from the, these engravings are from a 16th century um, copy of the statutes of the order, which we happen to own. It's a very beautiful book, a rare book. And it, like most statutes of the order, it combines history along with the statutes. And it includes notable events in the history of the order. Uh, one of the, but this is one engraving which purports to show the interior of the hospital. It, could, it is probably meant to depict the hospital in Malta, the Sacra Infermeria. But take a look at this guy here. Uh, the, the, the volume also includes a series of portraits of past Grand Masters. In fact, this is the volume that I pulled the portrait of Gerard from, the one that I liked. And this is the second Grand Master, uh, Ramon de Puy. He was Grand Master from a, about 1120 to 1170. It was under him that a series of statutes were promulgated, that the hospital became more militarized. And to me, it looks like he's serving in the hospital here which was the custom of the order that the master should serve at least once a week in the main wards of the hospital. So you get this conflation of their medieval history with their modern, with their modern, up-to-date, advanced hospital in Malta. Now, <clears throat> Giacomo Basio uh, was not a member of the Order of the Hospital. He was uh, related to uh, a knight of the Order who became a vice chancellor. And the Order commissioned him to write a history of the Order. And what I think is extraordinary is that he stayed in Rome and they sent him documents from the archives which he used for his history. And not only is that extraordinary, but when he was done with them, he sent them back. <laughs> you, know, uh, you know, obviously, you know, an extraordinary man. And his account of the history of the order of the hospital is still, you know, it's still the, the source that historians go back to. You know, whenever you're looking at any particular period, uh, you look to see what Basio says because he's the first one who read through all of the primary sources. He is the one who established the narrative of hospitaler history. And he takes the origins back to what William of Tyre said. You know, he removes, he doesn't mention any of the stories of the miracula. It's just very straightforward. It's the Amalfite merchants. It's uh, Gerard. Uh, it happened you know, sometime in the 11th century, and then he begins the history of the order with the papal bull, P.A. Postulatio Voluntatus. Then, let's fast forward about, well, 400 years or so, to the web, and Modern mythologies. Because where is the home of pseudoscience and pseudohistory today? It's the World Wide Web. And these are some of the sources that I pulled up. And we've got some time to take a peek at them. Here's New Advent Catholic Encyclopedia. Of course, yes, it's the old Catholic Encyclopedia. It's not the modern Catholic Encyclopedia. But <coughs> uh, and here is the story of the, uh, of the 
foundation of the hospital, but they mention the Italian hospice founded in 1050, but they say there is no way that it could be related to the order of the hospital. Furthermore, you know, furthermore, the Amalfite Hospital was Benedictine. Gerard's Hospital was Augustine. Well, that is, you know, that is kind of, that is an issue with the foundation of at least one other military religious order, the Order of Calatrava because you know, the Order of Calatrava in Spain was founded by the Order of Citao, Cito. Uh, this was founded by the Order of St. Benedict. Both of them are, kind, are more contemplative. And if you're going to run a hospital, uh, it requires a more active lifestyle. So both the Order of Cito and apparently the Order of the Hospital modified these rules or adopted new rules. And the statutes of the order of the hospital uh, were not really established until the mid 12th century. But uh, here's, you know, here's the Catholic encyclopedia that's supposed to be authoritative, making troubles. Here, this one is Don't you love those 1990s style websites? You know, with the wallpaper and the animations. Uh, this site was mounted by the um, by the South African Priory of the Order of Malta, so it is it is a recognized affiliate of the of the Sovereign Military Order of the Hospital of Jerusalem of Rhodes and of Malta. But look at the name, Blessed Gerard, Gerard Tonk or Gerardo del Sasso. You know, poor Gerard, we don't even know his name. Uh, according to tradition, his name is Tunc, T-U-N-C. Hey, those of you who studied Latin? No? Oh. <laughs> what? Tess is nodding her head. Uh, Tunk is not a name. It's it's a conjunctive. It's then, and it's and what there and what whoever decided that this was Gerard's name is extracting it from a sentence in a chronicle or in an account. So in English, his name would be translated as Gerard then. Now uh, this group, um, they now. They, they got rid of that website, but uh, Christus Rex picked it up and reposted it because it was about Gerard. Uh, their new uh, website, oh, here it is. They've changed their name of their brotherhood. It is the Brotherhood of Blessed Gerard. They've gotten rid of the Tunk, which, which I'm sure is a relief, but they, they still have the, the nice animation going. Oh, here we go. And you can find him and find a grave. <laughs> and this was taken from Wikipedia. Uh, and so here, here's all the versions of his surname. Uh, and then the military and hospitaller order of St. Lazarus of Jerusalem, not related to the order of Malta. Uh, you 
And he could have been born in Amalfi, or he could have been born in Provence, or he could have been born in Hanau. And he made his way to Jerusalem, and, and here's the name of the bull, and it gets the name of the bull wrong. And it lists as his burial, the monastery of St. Ursula in Valletta. Actually, his relics are scattered all over uh, Europe and, um, and the world, too. Uh, the last time his skull was put in a new reliquary, uh, it was examined and some chips were removed to be sent to new locations. So, his, um, so when you're a saint, you, you don't get to rest in peace, obviously. So, <clears throat> okay, so this is the 21st century, and these, these stories are still circulating, albeit on the internet. And, and we have to, you know, and I, you have to ask why. You know, why are they still out there? Is it because people love a good story? Um, is it because any, anything can go out on the internet? Or is it that, or is it that people, or is pseudo history at work that people are bound to this idea that, I, I've read other sites that said that the hospital was initially founded by Gregory the Great, and it was then renewed by Charlemagne. And it was then sacked in, uh, in 1009. And then the Amalfitans renewed it in 1048. And yes, it's true. Gregory the Great established a hospital in Jerusalem. And Charlemagne sent a survey to Jerusalem. And Charlemagne, I remind you, is 9th century. And established a hospital there. But there's nothing linking the two. There's no evidence linking the two. And whether the Amalfitite merchants, uh, oh, I did that. Whether the Amalfitite merchants uh, restored a hospital or established a new hospital, uh, we don't know. And in a way, it doesn't really matter. You know. But. You know, Helen Nicholson has suggested, and I think that this is, this is I, I think she's onto something here, that these stories circulated because the hospitaler circulated them. Uh, in the, Gerard, remember Gerard, we know about Gerard because he went around collecting donations. And how do you collect money from people? You tell them a good story. And, and what's a better story than our hospital, you know, Jesus Christ walked the wards of our hospital. You know, it, it gave this, this hospital continuity. It gave it, it gave it, um, it gave it ancientness. It gave it biblical, you know, it, veracity. Uh, Guillaume Carosan. 1489, He's, all of his writing was an effort to raise money to build roads against the Turks. So he is invested in establishing a lineage for the hospital that goes back to the New Testament. In fact, those websites that I showed you, uh, the Brotherhood of the Blessed Gerard, that is a legitimate hospital organization. Uh, the, uh, even the website of the official website of the Order of Malta lists the origins of the hospital as 1048, which we don't know for sure. I didn't show you any of the websites from the so-called mimic orders, uh, the ones that take the name of the order of the hospital, uh, but are not affiliated with it in any way, shape, or form. And 
those have some really, really, if you want to see pseudo history, uh, that's the place to go. And, you know, to conclude, what's the danger? I mean, like, why should we care about pseudo history? Well, why do we care about pseudoscience? You know, why is there, why is there uh, a magazine called Skeptical Inquirer? Well, the argument for pseudoscience is that, against pseudoscience, is that it leads people astray. Uh, people who need medical intervention or people who have psychological problems, uh, they're not seeking the help that they need. Or people refuse to believe in certain scientific processes, and that affects the way that public funds are allocated or courses are taught in public schools. In regards to the history of the order of the hospital, it's still a living, vibrant religious organization with a definite mission. And it's a mission that does a great deal of good. And if, and, and if they, and if they present a different view of their history, or if they let others present an inaccurate view of their history, they're losing their own identity. Uh, the modern order has a considerable problem with mimic orders that take, that appropriate and usurp their name and their identity. And unless or rather I should say, taking control of your history is an important part of your identity. And I'll leave you with that. And thank you. <laughs>